Rules for Radicals. A Pragmatic Primer for Realistic Radicals by Saul D. Olinsky. Well, I'm not going to read all of the personal acknowledgments and dedications. There is one that I, I think I should honor. Well, there's two that I think I should honor based on the wishes of the man himself. Um, one is the entirety of the book dedication is to Irene. Um, I think it matters that we keep that in per his own wishes. But one of the most important dedications <laughs> in the book uh, one of the quotes that's included amongst Rabbi Hillel and Thomas Paine. Um, we'll go down the list. Rabbi Hillel, where there are no men, be thou a man. Thomas Paine, let them call me rebel and welcome. I feel no concern from it, but I should suffer the misery of devils were I to make a whore of my soul. And then Saul Alinsky himself. Lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical. From all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which. The first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he won his own kingdom. Lucifer. Prologue. The revolutionary force today has two targets, moral as well as material. Its young protagonists are one moment reminiscent of the idealistic early Christians, yet they also urge violence and cry, burn the system down. They have no illusions about the system, but plenty of illusions about the way to change our world. It is to this point that I have written this book. These words are written in desperation, partly because it is what they do and will do that will give meaning to what I and the radicals of my generation have done with our lives. They are now the vanguard, and they had to start almost from scratch. Few of us survived the Joe McCarthy Holocaust of the early 50s, and of those were there even fewer whose understanding and insights had developed beyond the dialectical materialism of orthodox Marxism. My fellow radicals who were supposed to pass on the torch of experience and insights to a new generation were just not there. As the young looked at the society around them, it was all, in their words, materialistic, Decadent, bourgeois in its values, bankrupt, and violent. Is it any wonder that they rejected us in toto? Today's generation is desperately trying to make some sense out of their lives and out of the world. Most of them are products of the middle class. They've rejected their materialistic backgrounds, the goal of a well-paid job, suburban home, automobile, country club membership, first-class travel, status, security, and everything that meant success to their parents. They have had it. They watched it lead their parents to tranquilizers, alcohol, long-term endurance marriages or divorces, high blood pressure, ulcers, frustration, and the disillusionment of the good life. They have seen the almost unbelievable idiocy of our political leadership in the past political leaders, uh, ranging from the mayors to governors to the White House, were regarded with respect and almost reverence. Today, they're viewed with contempt. This negativism now extends to all institutions, from the police and the courts to the system itself. We are living in a world of mass media which daily exposes society's innate hypocrisy, its contradictions, and the apparent failure of almost every facet of our social and political lives. The young have seen their activist participatory democracy turn into its antithesis, a nihilistic bombing and murder. The political panaceas of the past, such as the revolutions in Russia and China and France, have become the same old stuff under a different name. The search for freedom does not seem to have any road or destination. The young ones are inundated with a barrage of information, in fact, so overwhelming that the world has come to seem an utter bedlam, which has them spinning in a frenzy, looking for what man has always looked for from the beginning of time a way of life that has some meaning or sense. 
A way of life means a certain degree of order where things have some relationship and can be pieced together into a system that at least provides some clues as to what life is about. Men have always yearned for and sought direction by setting up religions, inventing political philosophies, creating scientific systems like Newton's, or formulating ideologies of various kinds. This is what is behind the common cliché, getting it all together. Despite the realization that all values and factors are relative, fluid, and changing, and that it'll be possible to get it all together only relatively. The elements will shift and move together just like the changing patterns in a turning kaleidoscope. In the past, the world, whether in its physical or intellectual terms, was much smaller, simpler, and more orderly. It inspired credibility. Today, everything is so complex as to be incomprehensible. Today, everything is so complex <laughs> what sense does it make for men to walk on the moon while other men are waiting on welfare lines or in Vietnam killing and dying for a corrupt, di corrupt dictatorship in the name of what? Freedom? These are the days when man has his hands on the sublime while he is up to his hips in the muck of madness. The establishment in many ways is as suicidal as some of the far left except that they're in infinitely more destructive than the far left can ever be. The outcome of the hopelessness and despair is morbidity. There's a feeling of death hanging over the nation. Today's generation faces all this and says, I don't want to spend my life the way my family and their friends have. I want to do something to create, to be me, to do my own thing, to live. The older generation doesn't understand and worse, doesn't want to. I don't want to be just a piece of data to be fed into a computer or a statistic in a public opinion poll, just a voter carrying a credit card. To the young, the world seems insane and falling apart. On the other side is the older generation, whose members are no less confused. If they're not as vocal or conscious, it may be because they can escape to a past where the world was simpler. They can still cling to the old values in the simple hope that everything will work out somehow, some way, that the younger generation will straighten out with the passing of time. Unable to come to grips with the world as it is, they retreat in any confrontation with the younger generation with that infuriating cliche, when you get older, you'll understand. One wonders at their reaction if some youngsters were to reply, when you get younger, which will never be, then you'll understand. So, of course, you'll never understand. Those of the older generation who claim a desire to understand say, when I talk to my kids or their friends, I'll say to them, look, I believe what you have to tell me is important and I respect it. You call me a square and say that I'm not with it or I don't know where it's at or I don't know where the scene is and it's all the rest of the words you use. Well, I'm going to agree with you. So suppose you tell me, what do you want what do you mean when you say, I want to do my own thing? What the hell is your thing? When you say you want a better world, like what? And don't tell me a world of peace and love and all the rest of that stuff because people are people. And as you'll find out when you get older, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to say anything about when you get older. I really do respect what you have to say. Now, why don't you answer me? Do you know what you want? Do you know what you're talking about? Why can't we get together? And this, that is what we call the generational gap. What the present generation wants is what all generations have always wanted. A meaning. A sense of what the world and life are and a chance to strive from some sort of order. If the young were now writing our Declaration of Independence, they would begin when in the course of inhuman events. And their bill of particulars would range from Vietnam to our black Chicano and Puerto Rican ghettos to the migrant workers to Appalachia, to the hate, to the ignorance, disease, and starvation in the world. Such a bill of particulars would emphasize the absurdity of human affairs and the forlornness and emptiness, the fearful loneliness that comes from not knowing if there is any meaning to our lives. When they talk of values, they're asking for a reason. They're searching for an answer, at least for a time, to man's greatest question. 
Why am I here? The young react to their chaotic world in different ways. Some panic and run, rationalizing that the system is going to collapse anyway of its own rot and corruption, and so they're copping out. Going hippie or yippie, taking drugs, trying communes, anything to escape. Others went for pointless, sure-loser confrontations so that they could fortify their rationalization and say, well, we tried and did our part, and they copped out too. Others, sick with guilt and not knowing where to turn or what to do, went berserk. These were the weathermen and their like. They took the grand cop-out. Suicide. To these, I have nothing to say or give but pity. And in some cases, contempt for such as those who leave their dead comrades and take off for Algeria or other points. What I have to say in this book is not the arrogance of unsolicited advice. It is the experience and counsel that so many young people have questioned me about through all-night sessions of, on hundreds of campuses in America. It is for those young radicals who are committed to the fight, committed to life. Remember, we're talking about revolution, not revelation. You can miss the target by shooting too high as well as too low. First, there are no rules for revolutions anymore than there are rules for love or rules for happiness. But there are rules for radicals who want to change their world. There are certain central concepts of action in human politics that operate regardless of the scene or the time. To know these is basic to a pragmatic attack on the system. These rules make the difference between being a realistic radical and being a rhetorical one who uses the tired old words and slogans like calling the police pig or white fascist racist or just motherfucker and has so stereotyped themselves that others react by saying, oh, he's one of those. And then promptly turn off. This failure of many of our younger activists to understand the art of communication has been disastrous. Even the most elementary grasp of the fundamental idea that one communicates within the experience of their audience and gives full respect to the other's values would have ruled out attacks on the American flag. The responsible organizer would have known that it's the establishment that has betrayed the flag while the flag itself remains the symbol of America's hopes and aspirations and they would have conveyed this message to their audience. On another level of communication, humor is essential. For through humor, much is accepted that would have been rejected if presented seriously. This is a sad and lonely generation. It laughs too little, and this, too, is tragic. For the real radical, doing his thing is to do the social thing for and with people. In a world where everything is so interrelated that one feels helpless to know where or how to grab, hold, and act, defeat sets in. For years, there have been people who have found society too overwhelming and have withdrawn, concentrated on doing their own thing instead. Generally, we've put them into mental hospitals, diagnosed them as schizophrenics, if the real radical finds that having long hair sets up psychological barriers to communication and organization, they cut their hair. If I were organizing in an Orthodox Jewish community, I would not walk in there eating a ham sandwich unless I wanted to be rejected so I could have an excuse to cop out. My thing, if I want to organize, is solid communication with the people in the community. Lacking communication, I am, in reality, silent. Throughout history, silence has been regarded as assent, and in this case, assent to the system. As an organizer, I start from where the world is, as it is, not as how I would like it to be. That we accept the world as it is does not in any sense weaken our desire to change it into what we believe it should be. It is necessary to begin where the world is if we're going to change it to what we think it should be. That means working in the system. There's another reason for working inside the system. Dostoevsky said that taking a new step is what people fear most. 
Any revolutionary change must be preceded by passive, affirmative, non-challenging attitude towards change among the mass of our people. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that then, then they're willing to let go of the past and chance the future. This acceptance is the reformation essential to any revolution. To bring on this reformation requires that the organizer work inside the system. Among not only the middle class, but the 40% of American families, more than 70 million people whose income ranges from 5000 to 10000 a year. They cannot be dismissed by labeling, labeling them blue collar or hard hat or low skilled they will not continue to be relatively passive and slightly challenging, uh, challenging if we fail to communicate with them, if we don't encourage them to form alliances with us, they will move to the right. Maybe they will anyway, but let's not let it happen by default. Our youth are impatient with the preliminaries that are essential to purposeful action. Effective organization is thwarted by the desire for instant and dramatic change, or as I've phrased it elsewhere, the demand for revelation rather than revolution. It's the kind of thing we see in playwriting. The first act introduces the characters in the plot. In the second act, the plot and characters are developed as the play strives to hold the, attention, uh, the audience's attention. In the final act, Good and evil have their dramatic confrontation and resolution. The present generation wants to go right into the third act, skipping the first two, in which case there is no play. Nothing but confrontation for confrontation's sake. A flare-up and back to darkness. To build a powerful organization takes time. It is tedious, but that's the way the game is played. If you want to play and not just yell, kill the umpire. What is the alternative to working inside the system? A mess of rhetorical garbage about burn the system down. Some yippee yells, do it or do your own thing. What else? Bombs, sniping, silence when police are killed or screams of murdering fascist pigs when others are killed, attacking and baiting the police, public suicide. Power comes out of the barrel of a gun is an absurd rallying cry when the other side has all the guns. Lenin was a pragmatist. Truth. When he returned to what was then Petrograd from exile, he said that the Bolsheviks stood for getting power through the ballot, but would reconsider after they got the guns. Militant mouthings? Spouting quotes from Mao, Castro, and Che Guevara? Which are as germane to our highly technological, computerized, cybernetic, nuclear-powered mass media society as a stagecoach on a jet runway at Kennedy Airport. Let us, in the name of radical pragmatism, not forget that in our system, with all its repressions, we can still speak out and denounce the administration, attack its policies, work to build an opposition, uh, oppositional political base. True, there is government harassment, but there still is that relative freedom to fight. I can attack my government, try to organize to change it. There's more than, uh, that's more than I can do in Moscow, Peking, or Havana. Remember, the reaction of the Red Guard to the Cultural Revolution and the fate of the Chinese college students? Remember that. Just a few of the violent episodes of bombings or a courtroom shootout that we've experienced here would have resulted in a sweeping purge and mass executions in China, Russia, or Cuba. Let's keep some perspective, shall we? We will start with the system because there is no other place to start from except political lunacy. It is most important for those of us who want revolutionary change to understand that revolution must be preceded by reformation. It's just how things work. To assume that a political revolution can survive without, supporting, uh, without the supporting base of a popular reformation is to ask for the impossible in politics. 
Men don't like to step abruptly out of the security of familiar experience. They need a bridge to cross from their own experience to a new way. A revolutionary organizer must shake up the prevailing patterns of their lives, agitate, create disenchantment and discontent with the current values to produce, if not a passion for change, at least a passive, affirmative, non-challenging climate. Quote, the revolution was effected before the war commenced, John Adams wrote. The revolution was in the hearts and minds of the people. This radical change in the principles, opinions, sentiments, and affections of the people was the real American revolution. End quote. A revolution without a prior reformation collapses or becomes totalitarian tyranny. A reformation means the masses of our people have reached the point of disillusionment with past ways and values. They don't know what will work, but they do know that the prevailing system is self-defeating, frustrating, and hopeless. They won't act for change, but they won't strongly oppose those who do. The time is then ripe for revolution. Those who, for whatever combination of reasons, encourage the opposite of reformation, becoming the unwitting allies of the far political right. Parts of the far left have gone so far in the political circle that they're now all but indistinguishable from the extreme right. It reminds me of the days when Hitler, new on the scene, was excused for his actions by humanitarians on the grounds of a paternal rejection and childhood trauma. When there are people who espouse the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy or the Tate murders or the Marin County Courthouse kidnapping and killings or the University of Wisconsin bombing and killings as revolutionary acts, then we're dealing with people who are merely hiding psychosis behind a political mask. The masses of people recoil with horror and say, our way is bad and we were killing to let it change, but... Certainly not for this murderous madness. No matter how bad things are now, would they're better than that? So they begin to turn back. They regress into acceptance of a coming massive repression in the name of law and order. In the midst of the gassing and violence of the Chicago Police and National Guard during the 1968 Democratic Convention, many students asked me, do you still believe we should try to work inside our system? These were students who had been with Eugene McCarthy in New Hampshire and followed him across the country. Some had been with Robert Kennedy when he was killed in Los Angeles. Many of the tears that were shed in Chicago were not from gas. Mr. Olinsky, we fought in primary after primary, and the people voted on, on no on Vietnam. Look at that convention. They're not paying any attention to the vote. Look at your police and the army. You still want us to work within the system. It hurt me to see the American army with drawn bayonets advancing on American boys and girls. But the answer I gave the young radicals seemed to me the only realistic one. Do one of three things. One, go find a wailing wall and feel sorry for yourselves. Two, go psycho and start bombing. But this will only swing people to the right. Three, learn a lesson. Go home, organize, build power, and at the next convention, you be the delegates, you be in charge, you be the ones with the power. Remember, once you organize people around something as commonly agreed upon as, say, pollution, and then organize people, uh, and then unorganized people is on the move. From there, it's a short and natural step to political pollution, to Pentagon pollution. It's not enough just to elect candidates. You must keep pressure on. Radicals should keep in mind Franklin D. Roosevelt's response to a reform delegation. Okay, you've convinced me. Now go on out and bring pressure on me. Action comes from keeping the heat on. No politician can sit on a hot issue if you make it hot enough. As for Vietnam... I'd like to see our nation be the first in history of man to publicly say, we were wrong. What we did was horrible. We got in and kept getting in deeper and deeper, and at every step we invented new reasons for staying. 
We have paid part of the price in 44,000 dead Americans. There is nothing we can ever do to make it up to the people of Indochina or to our own people, but we will try. We believe that our world has come of age and so it is no longer a sign of weakness or defeat to abandon a childish pride and vanity, to admit we were wrong. Such an admission would shake up the foreign policy concepts of literally all nations and open the door to a new international order. This is our alternative to Vietnam. Anything else is the old makeshift patchwork. If this were to happen, Vietnam may even have been somewhat worth it. A final word on our system. The democratic ideal springs from the ideas of liberty, equality, majority rule through free elections, protection of the rights of minorities, and freedom to subscribe to multiple loyalties in matters of religion, economics, and politics rather than to a total loyalty to the state. The spirit of democracy is the idea of importance and worth in the individual and faith in the kind of world where the individual can achieve as much as their potential as possible. Great dangers always accompany great opportunities. The possibility of destruction is always implicit in the act of creation. Thus, the greatest enemy of individual freedom is the individual themselves. From the beginning, the weakness as well as the strength of the democratic ideal has been the people. People cannot be free unless they are willing to sacrifice some of their interests to guarantee the freedom of others. The price of democracy is the ongoing pursuit of the common good by all of the people. 135 years ago, Tocqueville, uh, Tocqueville gravely warned that unless individual citizens were regularly involved in the action of governing themselves, self-government would pass from the scene. Citizen participation is the animating spirit and force in a society predicated on volunteerism. We are not here concerned with people who profess the democratic faith but yearn for the dark security of dependency where they can be spared the burden of decision. Reluctant to grow up or incapable of doing so, they want to remain children and be cared for by others. Those who can should be encouraged to grow. For the others, the fault lies not in the system, but in themselves. Here, we are desperately concerned with the vast mass of our people who thwarted through the lack of interest or opportunity or both do not participate in the endless responsibilities of citizenship and are resigned to live lives determined by others. To lose your identity as a citizen of democracy is but a step from losing your identity as a person. People react to this frustration by not acting at all. The separation of the people from the routine daily functions of citizenship is heartbreak in a democracy. It is a grave situation when people resign their citizenship or when a resident of a great city, though they may desire to take a hand, lacks the means to participate. That citizen sinks further into apathy, further into anonymity, and further into depersonalization. The result is that they come to depend on public authority and a state of civic sclerosis sets in. From time to time, there have been eternal enemies at our gates. There has always been the enemy within, the hidden and malignant inertia that foreshadows more certain destruction to our life and future than any nuclear warhead. There can be no darker or more devastating tragedy than the death of man's faith in himself and his power to direct his own future. I salute the present generation. Hang on to one of your most precious parts of youth, laughter, don't lose it, as many of you seem to have done. You need it. Together, we may find some of what we're looking for. Laughter, beauty, love, and the chance to create.